Okay. So yes. Uh, can you hear me okay with that? Cool. All right. So I am going to be talking to you today about effective policy change. So over the last 13,000 or so years of human history, our, our social organisation is becoming increasingly complex. So started out as hunter-gatherers and over the last 13,000 years we've worked our way through various stages of social organisation to today where we have modern nation states. Uh, now, when you have larger groups of people, when you have more social complexity, you end up with coordination problems. So these are problems uh, where, yeah, you have to coordinate the, the efforts and resources of a large number of people. Uh, things like, you know, building large re religious monuments or maybe uh, sort of irrigation systems, road networks, things like that. Uh, maybe also uh, having a large standing army so you can defend yourself in times of strife or maybe you can go out and conquer neighbouring territories to uh, expand yours. So all of these require a political solution. Uh, they're, they're very large, uh, complex problems and so the, the solution has inevitably been politics. Uh, so basically every modern nation state uh, organises itself uh, using politics and uh, whether the political structure is, is small and laissez-faire and, and sort of hands off or whether it's large and uh, sort of in intrusive or interventionist, uh, obviously most nation states are somewhere in between those two extremes, uh, but, but politics is sort of a fact of life. So EA has a lot of advice for us as individuals. Uh, we can choose an effective charity and donate to it. We can think about our career options and try and have the most effective career. Uh, we can promulgate these ideas and so that other individuals can engage with them. Uh, but when we start to think about bigger problems, so problems that other people have, uh, have raised here, um, I, I think we start to get into this realm of where we have coordination problems and that actually probably the only way that we're going to see a lot of headway on them is by engaging with the political process. So things like you know, existential risk, um, things like, uh, you know, global pandemic, uh, or what about uh, things like uh, making sure that people can, you know, overcome their biases and become happier and healthier individuals. Things like uh, addressing the causes of disease and poverty rather than just the symptoms. Now, some of these problems are likely to go away by themselves, uh, just, you know, the, the world will change. Uh, some of them will have uh, really innovative and advanced technological solutions that will uh, make them uh, things of the past. So uh, you can think of advances in medical science as being part of this. But many will not. And uh, so I think that, uh, that a lot of these problems, uh, and, and whether it's the problems that I've raised today or, or other problems that you see in your, in your community or in, in, in the larger world, uh, they're going to require a, a political solution. So politics is messy and I think a lot of people have this kind of internal resistance to wanting to engage with it. Uh, it's full of compromise, it's full of bastardry, it's full of bad intentions. Uh, no one has a good word to say about anyone who engages with it. But I think that we can really uh, not afford to ignore it as a movement uh, because I think the, the uh, potential for, for doing good there is really high. So uh, I think... Um, yeah, we should, um, I'm here to basically advocate that we start thinking about uh, political solutions to some of these problems. So now, as you know, my current role is uh, in the uh, communications director of uh, giving what we can. But my background is actually in politics. And I've talked to a few, about, a few of you here about this, but um, yes, yeah, so I used to work for, um, uh, I'm sure most of you have uh, the former finance minister and current uh, shadow trade minister, Penny Wong. Uh, also, um, I was on the team that was uh, campaigning in the South Australian state election in 2014, which we, uh, we somehow won. Um, we had a, a great campaign. Uh, but that's uh, Jay Weatherall, the Premier in South Australia. I was working for him. I've worked for a few other South Australian politicians. Uh, and uh, before that, I was sort of a party activist working on political campaigns, election campaigns, that sort of thing. So uh, most of my adult life, I've, I've actually worked in politics. Now. I guess my, my political start probably came when I was about 15 years old and uh, at high school I started a little activist organisation and we did things like we printed up badges, um, you know, decrying the Iraq war, um, so it gives you some idea of how long ago this was. Uh, we, we put banners from a, um, uh, like an overpass in Adelaide and uh, you can see, it's very clever, it's the, the Liberal Party logo, but you, you see what we've done, you see what we've done? Uh, and uh, honk out Howard, you know, get the motorists to, uh, to lean on their horn. 
Um, by this point, you can probably tell uh, what my, uh, my political persuasions are. I, I hope that you won't hold them against me. Um, obviously, uh, politics is quite a tribal thing, and if you have different uh, political predilections, I hope that you'll uh, put them aside uh, while you're, uh, you're listening to me. I hope this advice is uh, sort of fairly universal. But anyway, I, I think this, this was something um, that, that you could say we probably didn't achieve very much with this kind of activism. I don't know if anyone remembers the, the outcome of the 2004 federal election, but Mark Latham made a fairly inauspicious exit from, uh, from Australian politics, uh, and, and John Howard went on to uh, be the longest serving Prime Minister in Australia's history since Rob Menzies. So you could say that, that we didn't necessarily achieve that much with our, with our activism. But the thing is, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, and, and we really enjoyed it, and uh, we really felt like we were doing something. Now, I, I think we can probably make some parallels here between sort of that kind of political action and, and some sort of less effective altruism, we might say. So uh, we know that 300 billion US dollars is donated in the United States, or thereabouts, every year, uh, and that's, that's actually about the size of the Australian federal budget. Uh, so, uh, for context, the World Health Organization's budget is about $4 billion. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates releases about $4 billion in, in bequests every year. So, uh, you could think about the, the scale of what we could achieve with $300 billion. But we know that uh, often that that's, um, you know, locally focused projects, projects within the United States. Uh, and so, the, the effect of that money is, is to not do very much. And, and in a sense, I think it's that people are using... Uh, you know, because it's really difficult to know what makes a difference and it's really difficult to sort of see through uh, all the various different charities and obviously that's what something like Giving What We Can is designed to, uh, to, to alleviate. But uh, people generally just use giving to charity as a proxy for making a difference. And in the same way, I as a 15-year-old and I think a lot of uh, other activists tend to use this thing of making some noise as a proxy for making a difference. And it's difficult to tell whether that actually uh, does achieve very much. So my advocacy today, I guess, is that I think we can probably uh, achieve better results rather than standing on the outside and, and shouting, uh, although that might be part of a, an effective campaign. Uh, but the, the, the crux of it should be that we work within the system uh, and we, we engage with the current political process uh, and try and use it to our advantage uh, in order to affect some policy change. Uh, now, some of this stuff might seem kind of obvious. It might seem obvious to, to those of you who either have a policy background or just who have thought about it for, for a while, uh, that I think many activists, many people who want to uh, engage in, in a sort of political change don't necessarily engage with the process itself and engage with the reality that, uh, that you do need to engage with the process uh, in order to, to affect uh, substantial long-term change. So uh, just bear with me if it does seem like some of this stuff is a little bit obvious. Uh, as we've heard from other speakers, Knowing what the right course of action is one thing, uh, but, but actually being able to transform that into, into action is, is definitely another. And sometimes uh, you get really excited about an idea and you, you, you run off in one direction. Uh, and I'm saying consider a few other options, maybe take pause for thought and, um, and try and engage with, the, with a few different ways of making a difference. So just sort of thinking about this, let's say that there's an idea that you have which you think is really important uh, and you think it's going to change the world. It needs a political solution, so you need to turn it into legislation. So this is, this is generally, you know, the, the direction that you're wanting things to go. Now, of course, uh, this simple model here is uh, definitely not uh, just how it happens. doesn't just, just go like that. Uh, so I guess first thing that I'll do is walk you through kind of some of the, the different uh, steps in the process uh, that an idea takes from being a thought bubble in your head to being legislation that's binding on citizens and that, uh, that informs the actions of departments. So... Uh, like I said, you're starting out with an idea. Uh, the idea uh, could come from you know, a think tank, a researcher, an academic. It uh, could come from uh, say, a, a campaign in the public uh, space, so uh, through the media. It uh, could come from just like a concerned individual. Uh, often uh, ideas for, for public policy come from other politicians. So uh, if they're not, not coming from within the government, they might be suggested by uh, uh, politicians' colleagues on the backbenches or, or from a crossbencher. So in this case, you're the person with the idea. The next step uh, from, from taking it from idea to legislation is to go to a minister. So minister heads up a department, has a, an area of portfolio responsibility. 
Uh, and basically what happens is the minister, you, you go into the minister's office, you try and convince them that you, your policy is really, uh, really important. Uh, not only is it going to save their department money, it's going to be great for their political career, uh, but it's also going to, you know, change Australia or change the world. Uh, it's cost effective. It's, it's got all these great things going for it. So uh, you make your best pitch to the minister, and if they're convinced, maybe they send it off to a department. So uh, a department uh, will have a look at it and they'll basically sanity check your policy idea against the sort of what else the government is doing. So uh, contextualise it within current government policy, uh, work out what the budgetary implications of it are, work out whether it intersects with, with other policy uh, ideas that are currently uh, in the department, uh, whether it's duplicating stuff that's already been done, whether it's been tried before. And so uh, the department will... Uh, put together a briefing which sort of summarises the ideas and then uh, come up with a recommendation to the minister. And so they send that back to the minister and the minister can either accept the recommendation or, or reject it. Uh, and if they accept it and it's a positive recommendation, then you might uh, move on to the next step. But of course, the department could always come back and say, actually, uh, looking at this idea, it's completely crazy and there's no way we could fund it and it's completely pie in the sky and uh, we're not interested. And anyway, we tried it before and it was a complete disaster, so uh, don't do this. So assuming that doesn't happen, assuming the minister uh, wants to push it fur further forward, then they have to introduce it to cabinet. So cabinet is the, the sort of uh, deliberative body of all the ministers. So that's, that's all the government ministers, or most of them in the federal government, uh, who uh, come together and they, they make sort of whole of government decisions on policy. So it's not just up to the minister of a particular department, it's up to all the ministers to uh, say yay or nay to a particular uh, sort of uh, way forward with the policy. And they might raise objections, like uh, maybe the policy conflicts with something that's happening in their department, or maybe they're already, already doing something in this space. Uh, maybe they think that the programs that you're going to have to cut to fund your policy uh, aren't worth cutting, uh, so uh, they're, they're not prepared to fund the new policy. But uh, after there's some debate in Cabinet and uh, the, uh, the Cabinet votes on this, maybe it goes uh, further on. So Cabinet takes the policy, sends it off to a parliamentary drafts person, they turn it into a bill, and then they send it off to Parliament, which is probably the, the sort of part of this process that most people are familiar with. And uh, so Parliament, uh, obviously, uh, you know, most of you know it through question time, but there is also just a lot of uh, discussing and debating uh, policy. And so uh, Parliament is, is obviously... Uh, composed not just of the party of government, so in the lower house you might have a, an easy time of getting it through because the reason that your minister is a minister is because they're uh, part of the government and, and the party of government has the most seats in the lower house. So getting the policy through the lower house is probably fine, but uh, getting it through the upper house probably involves complicated negotiations with people from other political parties, uh, people who yeah, uh, might not necessarily have the same buy-in to the policy, so, uh, of course, uh, all those complex negotiations have to happen. That might uh, result in amendments to the policy, concessions. Uh, you might get the policy in there and then the, the really important part of the policy gets ripped out because it's untenable or, or unpalatable. Uh, and so the only way that they can get the, the shell of the policy through is, is to remove it. But uh, after the uh, parliament just sort of uh, debates on it, uh, it passes both houses of parliament, then it gets sent off a royal assent and then gets made into legislation, at which point you have a little celebration. Don't celebrate too hard because it could always be repealed. But, <laughs> but, uh, but so the, the, the point I'm trying to make, and this is obviously a really simplified version of this model, but uh, the point that I'm trying to get across is simply that uh, there are lots of uh, stages in this process, lots of points of failure. The, the process is very fraught, it's very slow moving, it's very tedious. But I think that it's important for us to know what this process is because when we actually want to go through the process of, of turning ideas we have into policy, we're going to need to engage with it. So in this simplified model, uh, there are sort of uh, four points at which you could uh, sort of uh, conceive of as, as, I guess, points of failure, possible points of failure, uh, or, or um, things that you might be able to influence as well. So uh, we've got the minister, the department, cabinet, and the parliament. And in terms of uh, what, you know, what I think is probably going to be the most effective, and I, I will caveat this by saying this is, this is based on my political experience and my, my experience in this space. Uh, it's not a hard and fast rule, and there might be other campaigns. I'm sure there are examples of other campaigns that have taken a different approach. But my advice, uh, based on, on my experience, is, uh, is basically that you should be focusing uh, your efforts on uh, targeting a minister. So the department, the cabinet, and the parliament are all... Uh, sort of important parts of the process, but they're complex. They're full of lots of people, lots of moving parts. It's very difficult uh, to influence them in an effective way. 
But the minister's the person that takes it to the department. They're the one that takes it to cabinet. And they're also the person that introduces legislation into parliament. So the minister's someone who is not only starts the process off, but they follow the process through each of those steps. So uh, I think in terms of uh, you and your limited resources and where you might engage with this process, uh, the minister's probably where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck. So how do you get in touch with the minister? How do you influence a minister's uh, decision making? Do you just send them a letter and hope for the best? Do you get hundreds of your friends to start a campaign and uh, sort of try and pressure the minister into action? Do you take to the streets and protest? Look, I think all of these can be really important parts of, of an effective political campaign and I don't want to discount them at all. But I guess what I would advocate for is that you try and engage with the minister directly, uh, try and convince them of your policy idea directly uh, and try and get them to, to buy into it so that they'll happily sort of take it through that process and, and engage with it. So uh, again, this is broad brush strokes, uh, so don't uh, take this as hard and fast. Think of it more as me introducing some concepts that are probably going to be quite useful when thinking about this process. Uh, but this is, this is sort of a uh, like two minute version of, of a strategy that you could employ if you were trying to take a policy idea uh, and uh, bring it through the political process uh, using a minister. So the first step is know your product. Uh, so this is, this is critical, I think echoes some of the things that John Daly was saying yesterday. You need to know your policy area inside and out. You need to know exactly what the problem is. You need to know exactly what the solutions are, uh, or at least uh, hint very, very strongly at what the solutions are. Uh, and you need to know basically all of the rebuttals that uh, could possibly be, uh, be mounted. What are the obvious counter arguments? So if you go into a minister's office and, and they immediately uh, fire off, well, here are three objections that I thought of just off the top of my head then how do you counter those? So try and test your policy out, stress test it with people who aren't as invested in the idea as you are, work out what the, uh, the, the sort of criticisms are and see if they're, like they might be valid criticisms and that might mean that you need to uh, modify your policy accordingly or at least reframe it. Ideally, I say at this stage, you want to, uh, so when I say your product, I'm, of course I'm, I'm talking sort of metaphorically about the, the idea, but also I'm talking about have, if you can, have an actual sort of, uh, I guess, briefing spec paper so that has the, the idea that you're talking about outlined in very clear terms, uh, solution, so like exactly what you want the solution to be, what you're asking of the minister outlined in very clear terms, a brief pricey of sort of explaining in a bit more depth so that uh, their advisors can look through it and sort of check out that it makes sense, and then a lot of research behind that. So uh, if, you, if you can do that, then you've got a product that you can actually put into someone's hands and hopefully that will start to convince them uh, of your position. The next thing you should do is start building a coalition. So uh, this is partly because, you know, who are you? you do you have any credibility? Uh, you know, not to, uh, to cast any aspersions on any of you lovely people, but in the eyes of a minister, probably not. So the, the first thing that you want to do is build a coalition of other people who can uh, give you credibility and help you sell your message more effectively. So that could be academics and researchers and think tanks who might be able to give you some intellectual heft uh, and basically uh, make it seem like you've, uh, you've really done your homework. Uh, it might be uh, just someone who could be like the face of a campaign, that is someone who is affected by this issue. Now, for, for the large scale issues that we're talking about, this might not be uh, as easy. Uh, although you might sort of think of like, oh, climate change is raising sea levels, so maybe someone who uh, is, is a potential climate refugee, someone who can be a face of the campaign is really important. Uh, and, and that's not, this, this coalition building stage is not just important for you impressing the minister. If a minister has to go out and sell the policy to the public, they want people who they can line up who are apolitical and who uh, are there to give them credibility. So you're, you're not just building a coalition to uh, sort of uh, give yourself uh, sort of allies and network of people, uh, all that sort of stuff. You're also asking uh, people to be uh, sort of uh, people who the minister can use uh, as, as adding credibility to their presentation of the issue. Next. Find a minister, get to know them. Now, I say find a minister because it's not always intuitively obvious who the right minister is for your particular issue. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's say you, you need the government to change the way that it spends money. Uh, do you go to the Treasury or is actually, because it's internal spending, is that actually handled by the Department of Finance? Uh, if you're trying to prevent, you know, a, a like, big pandemic by increasing safety standards in laboratories, then do you want to go to the Federal Minister for Science, who has you know, some sort of broad remit over all scientific research, or do you actually need to go to your state industrial relations and workplace uh, minister 
who actually has remit over the uh, you know um, safety standards and, and workplace practices. So they might actually be the person that you need to talk to. So finding a minister is not always intuitively obvious. Once you have found a minister, though, get to know them. What are they interested in? What are their ideologies? What faction are they part of in the party? Like, what have they been doing in the media? What policies have they been pushing? What was their previous role? All of these kinds of things will help you, not just because they help you frame your policy and, and know what the minister's going to find interesting. Uh, they also help you avoid any faux pas in meetings. Uh, and they also just mean that you can engage with the minister on their level. You're, you're not sort of flying blind when, a, when the minister raises something uh, in a meeting. Next, you want to make contact and build relationships. So making contact with the office, uh, you want to push to get a meeting with the minister so that you can get some you know, one-on-one -on -one time that you can uh, push your policy idea and you can, you can explain it to them, you can convince them, you can pitch it to them. Building relationships is important and it's not just important to build a relationship with the minister. You also want to have good relationships with all of their advisors and this goes as far as the office staff. Uh, now, obviously, you should never be sort of rude or condescending to office staff just as a matter of common courtesy, uh, but just in, in particular, they're the person who's going to remind the advisor that you called and wants, you know, you want them to call back. So don't, don't alienate anyone in this, this process. Uh, build, you know, be really professional, build some great relationships. Then you want to meet with the minister and have some specific demands. So this goes back, hopefully you've, you've done your homework in step one. So you have, you know, a list of things or, or a suite of uh, different things, a raft of measures, as the Hollow Men would call it, uh, to, uh, to say, this is exactly what I, I want to, uh, to achieve. So here is the problem, here are my proposed solutions. Now, I say have specific demands, A, because no minister is going to take you seriously if you go in and really convincingly outline a problem and then say, well, there's maybe nothing we can do about it. Uh, that's, that's not something that a minister is going to engage with seriously. Uh, but it also, yeah, I think having specific demands sharpens your focus. It's not just about, uh, you know, how persuasive you are, it's also about how uh, much you've engaged with your issue and your idea and, and whether you've been able to finesse it down to a point where there is a realistic solution. Take multiple paths. So, like I've said, focus your energy on the minister, but don't by any means limit yourself to that. Uh, so for a start, be opportunistic. If you know someone who works in a relevant department, if you know someone who works in another minister's office or you can get to know them, if you can convince other ministers that this is a great idea so that they're more likely to support it in Cabinet, uh, if you can start a public awareness campaign, if you can do any of these things, then you increase your likelihood of success. So uh, when I say focus on a minister, by no means do I say to the exclusion of any of these other things and, uh, yeah, taking to the streets in protest or something like that may in fact be, you know, you have to make a judgment call here, but it may in fact be something that at a particular time is actually a useful way of galvanising public support to add weight to the, uh, the, the case for change. Finally, follow up, be persistent and dig in. Uh, as, as John Daly said yesterday, political ta change takes a huge amount of time. There's uh, a really like, long period at which, uh, over which political change happens, and so it's important that you uh, stay the course. Now, just focusing on a couple of things here, uh, getting to know your minister and building a relationship with them, there are lots of things that a minister has uh, sort of impacting on them. So if you're, even if your idea is the most convincing idea in the world, if it doesn't mesh with other things that are competing for a minister's attention, it's not going to go anywhere. But conversely, if you think about these things as levers that you can pull on, uh, you might actually be able to exploit them and uh, make your case for change uh, even, even stronger. So say the party. The party is the politician's lifeblood. They're the people who pre-select them for next election. They're their support group. They're their bunch of colleagues. You wouldn't want to go ahead and alienate all the people in your workplace. So you can't alienate uh, the party if this policy is counter to the, the aims and, and the platform of the party or no one in the party is going to support it. It's going to be a problem. Conversely, if you can uh, find a political activist who's willing to champion your policy and get it put into party platform, then that's a great uh, impetus to, uh, to make um, your, your policy uh, have legs. Constituency is an issue, so this is the broader voting public. Every minister is going to be responsible to a set of voters. So again, framing your policy so that it's acceptable to, to the electorate is important. Um, there's their personal interest in ideology. Never underestimate how uh, getting a minister interested in a policy makes them want to champion it. Uh, budget is, is also a problem. Uh, every, like every government department is budget constrained. Uh, if you can cost your policy and show that it doesn't actually cost very much, that's incredibly important. That'll definitely get someone's attention. 
uh, and then just focusing on interest groups in the media. Uh, both of these have the potential to be very useful to you, getting your message out uh, and, and being a support network, but also they can be enemies, so uh, make friends with them. Building relationships is really important, as I've said. Uh, one relationship that I think you should focus on is the advisors in the office. Uh, the number of times we said, well, the minister's really busy, but we can give you an advisor to meet with and you can explain the problem to them, and people get really huffy and think, well, I'm, I'm very important, I should be able to meet with the minister. Everyone thinks that, uh, everyone wants to meet with the minister, the minister's time is constrained. If you can meet with an advisor, take that opportunity, opportunity don't be that person. Uh, because advisors have a lot of sway over how policy is framed in the office, over how a minister responds to it. So definitely take the opportunity. If you can get a meeting with an advisor, uh, then I would, I would highly recommend that you do. Uh, and finally, uh, just to reiterate, be persistent and dig in. Change takes a lot of time, uh, as we've already gone over. Uh, it's the sort of thing that is going to be incredibly frustrating. It could stall at any of those points. But I think the, the thing that I really want to emphasise is that all of the times that you, you push the you know, you push the envelope, you push what's called the Overton window from something being totally uh, implausible and impossible all the way over to inevitable. Uh, every push in the right direction helps. And so it might not be you that gets the policy through, it might be someone in five or 10 or 15 years time, uh, but uh, everything helps and the, the more times that you can get people uh, engaged with the issue, uh, the better. Uh, so I just think, remember that change is possible. So dig in and, uh, and you can make change. And I think I'll leave you with this quote, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. It's from a uh, social anthropologist from the 50s, uh, Margaret Mead. Um, I think even though you've probably seen that quote and maybe it's starting to get a little hackneyed, I, I think uh, it's, it's extremely, you know, it certainly resonates with me. Uh, and I hope that you guys will be that small group of thoughtful and committed citizens, that you'll engage with our political process and you'll change the world. Thank you.